We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. <clears throat> One of the things that I struggle with almost weekly is the question of how do we take what Scripture says, some of it from 4,000 years ago, and make it our own? How do we take what happened to people that we never met in a place we've never been in? And apply it to ourselves in a way that changes us, that encourages us, that rearranges our faith walk in some way. So I want us to do a quick review of the Bible as we know it before we get into this morning's sermon and it'll become apparent why here in a little bit. What we refer to as the Old Testament, there are 39 documents there. The non-Messianic Jews, those Jews who do not believe Jesus is the Messiah, simply call it Scripture. Uh, as for them, there is no New Testament, so why would you call it the Old Testament? Christians divided into four parts. That's law, history, poetry, and prophecy. But the non-Messianic Jews just have three. They call it the law, the prophets, and the writings. So if it's not the law or the prophets, it's the general category, the writings. How important is the Old Testament to the 21st century Christian? How useful is it for you and I to know those things? We just finished last Sunday, uh, Sunday night before last, uh, a journey through the Old Testament. So hopefully we know more than we did when we started, and we've taken a look at the Israelites and about uh, the nations of Israel and Judah and some of their kings and some of the things that happened. We looked very sparingly at some of the prophecies toward the end of the Old Testament. But how important is the Old Testament to the 21st century Christian? We'll talk more about that in a minute. And then at least for the Christian, there's what we call the New Testament as in opposition to the Old Again, we typically divide it into four different parts. There's the Gospels, History, which is the Book of Acts, the Letters, which are both Pauline and General, and then at the very end you've got the Apocalypse. It's a very different kind of literature, a very different kind of writing. We call it the Revelation. We might think of the New Testament as being far more important to us than the Old Testament because it talks about Jesus and it talks about the church. And we're more connected to those things than we are to the Old Testament and to the Israelite nation or to the law of Moses. But both are very useful to us. And so as we go through this morning, we're going to have to extrapolate a little bit because Paul is talking to an audience that was very interested in the old law and the things that he tells them about the old law. We need to understand how that applies to us, you might be surprised at how closely connected we are. So we're going to start in chapter 10, verse 1. We're going to read the first 10 verses and then take a look. I don't want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, that they were all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as an example to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Don't be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and they got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did, and so were killed by snakes. And don't grumble as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. Now, some of those things you might be familiar with, some of those stories from the Old Testament. In particular, you're probably familiar with the account of the golden calf Moses is up on the mountain for 40 days, and when he comes back down, they've built themselves a calf, 
uh, Aaron's excuse, I threw in some gold and this is what came out. Uh, it's kind of lame, but they were all dancing and uh, praising this golden calf that their high priest Aaron told them was the God that brought them up out of Egypt. But did you notice all of the alls in that passage? I tried to give them a little extra punch because there's a whole bunch of alls in that passage. Uh, they were all baptized into their covenant, that is, into Moses. They were all involved in some kind of communion. Right? They, had, they all ate the same bread, and they all drank the same drink, which was Christ, the water that, that followed after them. Unleavened bread and water from the rock is kind of uh, connected to the body and the blood of Jesus in the New Testament communion. Uh, there's no blood of the sacrifice yet, but in some advanced way, they were connected to Christ. So Paul wants this first century Christian group to look back into the history of the Jewish people and to see that all of these people were enjoying the same kinds of relationship with God that they were back in the Old Testament baptized in Moses in the cloud and in the sea, ate the same food, drank the same drink. It's as if they were baptized and were taking communion in the Old Testament. That's the connection he wants his first century Christians to make. And then he follows that by saying, with most of them, God was not pleased and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Uh, this morning's sermon is not designed to talk about once saved, always saved. It's not designed to say, you know, pay attention to the fact that Paul is going to say that there were lots of people who were in a relationship with God somewhat similar to that in which you find yourselves, and yet, with most of them, God was not well pleased, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. He follows this connectedness, this baptism, and this communion reference with a list of ways that the Israelites offended God in the desert and what the ultimate outcome of those offenses were. Uh, they were all part of the plan, but most did not end up getting into the promised land. Uh, his point is clear enough. Even if you're part of a covenant agreement with God, even if you're enjoying relationship with God, you need to be careful about your relationship with God. Let's keep reading in verse 11. <clears throat> verse 11. These things happened to them as examples. And they were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? It is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, because we all share one loaf. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices partake in the altar? Do I mean then that food sacrificed to an idol is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No. But the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I don't want you to participate with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have part in both the Lord's table and in the table of demons. Are you trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? This is the third reference to fellowship meals. First, you have the fellowship meal of the Israelites. They ate the same uh, spiritual food. They all were part, partakers of that unleavened loaf uh, 
in the wilderness. Then you get to the New Testament Christians, and they are partakers in the body and the blood of Jesus. And then some of them were involved in pagan rituals in which they were involved in uh, ritual sacrifice and in ritual meals with pagan gods. And so Paul is saying, how can you be connected to God but also be so connected to the culture of Corinth that you allow yourself to mimic, to interchange these spiritual feasts so that one day you're feasting with God Almighty and the next day you're feasting with those who are honoring an idol. He says, and sure, I know you, you know that it's not a real God, but they don't know that. They're honoring their God. What they're doing is they're making sacrifices to demons, and in their demonic sacrifices, if you enter into that sacrificial meal with them, you're saying that you appreciate, that you condone, that you accept all of the things that they appreciate and condone and accept. <clears throat> so the first century Christians are told, look back at the Old Testament group. Look at the group in the wilderness. Remember what they did and, and how God responded. I want us now to take a lesson from the first century church as they're taking a lesson from the Old Testament congregation. Right? So it's this this continuation of thought. If you are in a situation where you might enter into some kind of cultural affair, some cultural event, that for you is no big deal because you're a Christian and you know that whatever it is that they're doing doesn't really make any difference and they, their God, their ritual, their thing is not a real thing. But they don't know that. And so as you enter into it with them, as you celebrate with them the things that they think are important, do you cross that line where you are sharing in the communion of the demons while you're sharing in the communion of Christ? Um, Winston Churchill borrowed a line from a guy named George Santanyama. But he said, those of you who do not learn from history are what? Destined to repeat it. So let's learn from some history. There's a danger in overconfidence when it comes to the boundless grace of God. And we live in a culture among a people who are increasingly <coughs> ungodly. In our desire to love people and to encourage people, to be non-offensive to people, there is an opportunity for us to pat folks on the back who are actually living in a sinful lifestyle. If we pat them on the back because we like them as people, if we encourage them because we like them, they're our friends, if we love them because they're human beings and all human beings need to be loved and deserve to be loved, there is always that danger that we cross a line where we don't approve of what they're doing. We biblically stand opposed to what they're doing, but they don't know that. It's important for us to set ourselves apart at least to the point that they understand that we do not accept the lifestyle or the emphasis of their living. Um, being too connected to the culture will eventually call for you to mingle what the world wants with what the Father wants. I guess we could make uh, examples from now on. But let, let me give you just a few. The church has in the last 70, 80 years increasingly asked the question, what is it that the people want? 
let's give the people what they want. And we know it's not that important um, that they want this or that in, in the worship because worship is worship and worship is the most important thing. And I would say, yeah, worship is the most important thing. The problem is that the farther you go, the more you encounter culture coming into the church. Our job is to see how much of the Lord we can get into the culture, not how much of the culture we can get into the church. And so in our attempt to love and accept and include, do we then come into communion with demons? Do we come into communion with those who are living a lifestyle that to them is very important, very self-defining? And for us, we're like, well, it's not that big a deal to us, but we like you and we want you to be part of us and we want to encourage you. So, you know, we, we bend a little bit. We bend a little bit more. We, we open up a little bit more until we are in full communion with those who are not us, with those who are not in communion with God. We're in 1 John during class on Sunday morning, which is where you should be at 930 if you're not. Then you should. Um, John says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with each other. That's where the fellowship comes from, because we're walking in the light as he is in the light. So if we walk with people who are not in the light, are we in fellowship? Paul would say no. We're not in fellowship when we're walking with those who are not in fellowship with God. If you're right with God, you're right with me. If you're not right with God, you're not right with me. So we have a culture that is increasingly pushing the limits and increasingly calling us to accept and condone the things that they are doing. Um, I don't want to get too specific, but there are uh, several Christian groups who are struggling these days with that question. How far do we go in allowing people to just be who they think they are and allowing people to live their lives in the way they want to live, even though those lifestyles are contrary to God and his call, how, how far do we go? How much of the world can we bring into the church until the church is just the world? And so Paul says, you can't be in fellowship with God as you're being in fellowship with just everything else. Um, Paul would say to the modern Christian, learn from the Corinthians who learned from the Old Testament followers of God from the Israelites. They were all connected to God like you're connected to God. But they were so tied to the culture that they couldn't take a stand for what God called them to be. Uh, I'm going to close with a, a short list of how people do <coughs> God. And I know from the looks on your face that I've done a poor job of communicating this to you. Uh, let me be a little more specific with you. It is Pride Month, LGBTQ Pride Month. I have an individual whom I love, whom I have shared many meals with, who I've traveled with in church circles and done things, uh, shared worship together with in the past, who came out this week. So if, if I'm a little muddled, perhaps is one of the reasons. Paul says, they are they and we are we. How do I respond? Do I still love them? Yes. Do I want the very best for them? Yes. Can I be in fellowship with them? No. no. I can't eat the meat offered to the idol without letting the person who sacrificed that meat think that I approve of the idol. How else can we stand and, and, and have truth of any kind if truth is only as strong as our friendship with the person who holds a different opinion? All right, this is a, a, a short list of how people view God, and you can add to it. Number one, God through Christ is sovereign. In other words, he's the king. He makes the rules. As James would say, he's a jealous God. He doesn't like to share his peace.
James writes, he says, do you think that the spirit that he put in us lusts to envy for no reason? That's strong, isn't it? That's King James. He lusts unto envy for no reason. Do you think that, that God doesn't care once you're his that you act like you're his? <laughs> Husbands, how how easily would we let our wives just run around with any old guy and keep saying, that's my girl. <laughs> we get tired of that in a hurry. We are the bride of Christ, and Christ does not take lightly when we just run around with any old people. Uh, second group, God's flexible. As long as we admit that he is Lord and try to follow his leadership, sin has more to do with not living up to my own potential than not living according to his law. I'll give you an example. Uh, lots and lots of Facebook memes that come across and they have nothing to do with God. They're all about being the best me. What does that mean? Well, when I'm satisfied with me, then I have arrived at being my best me. It has nothing to do with what God thinks. I believe in God, but God just wants me to be happy. He just wants me to be my best me. The third one, God's law is generally what I make it out to be. Even if I'm living in direct opposition to what the Bible says, he loves me and wants me to be happy. That is the vast majority of folks that you know. God just wants me to be happy. And I think that God wants this. I've heard people apply it to divorce. I've heard people apply it to remarriage. I know God wants me to be happy, so I'm going to do something that the Bible says don't do specifically. Because when I'm happy, then God is happy. I'm, I'm following God's will because what God wants is for me to be happy. So when I'm happy, I've done God's will, even though the thing that I'm doing specifically against God's will, scripturally. That's the mindset. People want God to want what they want. Uh, recently, I was watching a, a video where the individual was explaining that all of those passages in scripture that denounce the lifestyle that they're living are all just wrong that it's because we don't understand Scripture correctly. God's law is generally what I make it out to be. The things that I accept are true. The things that I don't accept are somehow false. Number four, the Bible is at best a list of rules handed down by rich, straight, white guys who just want to be in charge. If, the, if there is a God... He probably hates those guys. God hates me because I tell you what the Bible says. If I say that your lifestyle or your choices are not scriptural, then scripture is wrong. And if scripture is right and I'm right and God really said those things, then God is a bad God. The fifth one, there is no God. No rules but my rules and curses on anybody who would dare to oppose me. Again, I told the class that meets at 9.30 uh, about a video I was watching yesterday uh, where the individual was a street preacher and there was a group surrounding him yelling loudly cursings at him for being in their space saying things they didn't want to hear. I don't know of anybody that's been beat up yet, but I'm waiting on it. The word is becoming increasingly unpopular. We need to voice the truth. We need to stand true. We need to stand strong. In a culture that is taking communion with false gods and demons. Well, how deep into that list can we go? Right? All the way from God rules and makes the rules down to there is no God and I make my own rules. How far down those that list can we go and still not be guilty of mingling the blood of Christ with the sacrifice of the 